What is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? Brethren, he's praying that they would have a strength. That they would have supernatural, divinely given strength to be able to comprehend the love of Christ. Brethren, for some weeks, I was wanting to lead up to Mac coming. Didn't even realize Andy was going to come and hit us with the things that he did on Tuesday. Brethren, what I want for us, what I want for me, what I want for us, is that we press closer in. You know, I talked about those concentric circles. And some Christians live more tightly into the inner glory. Some are more aware. Some live more in the present. Some live more in the awareness of the love of Christ. That is just a reality. Some of us, some of us we know, as I've brought forth example after example after example from history of those who have been literally overwhelmed by the intensity of the love of Christ. Brethren, I know we need to think about this. We need to meditate on it. I know that that when we study in our own lives the times when we have been most taken up, brethren, on Tuesday night, you know one thing that jumped out at me? This guy right here asked, our visiting missionary about the time he was filled with the Spirit. I don't know if most of you caught this, but he's told me this in private. He has known this many, many times in his life. Not just that once. That was something Richard and I talked about. Is this a one-time ordeal for most people? This brother has known this thing repetitively. And there at the Grace House on Tuesday, he said, "This, my ears caught this. Repetitively. He has known visitations of this liquid love and manifestations of the love of God to his own soul. And he said... Not very loud. Typically in prayer. Did you guys catch that? Because that's when, that's when the, the greatest frequency of that kind of thing has happened in my life. And I latched on to that and I said, yes, that has been my own experience. And brethren, I know this. That at those times in prayer when that has happened, now I can't speak for him, but I can speak for me. And I can speak for Jonathan Edwards because he says so. He was praying and meditating on the person of Christ. And so would say many others. And when we're meditating and we're contemplating on the person of Christ and oftentimes on His love for us. Brethren, the truth is that when we sing the songs that we sing, is it not true that you are lifted up? Why is it? Brethren, one of the reasons is because we're not singing fluff. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? We're singing these songs. Why was I made to hear when so many make a wretched choice and rather starve than come? And you hear these. You take this, and can it be? These truths, brethren. I'll tell you this. Jonathan Edwards himself said that he sought to lift the affections, the feelings and the emotions of the people that he pastored as high as he possibly could. You say, was he talking about experience? Was he talking about feelings? Yes. He said, but I will only lift them as high as I can lift them with truth. That's where the charismatics go wrong. They want feeling 
When's the last time you heard Benny Hinn deal with justification or propitiation? You don't. And the feelings that come in that atmosphere are not fired by truth, but by something else. Brethren, this love of Christ ought to be one of the central topics that take up our minds. Thinking about what Christ has done for us. Brethren, that is what's going to lift you to glory. The love of Christ. And I realize, Paul's saying, I'm praying for you that you would have some kind of almighty empowerment through the Spirit of God. And brethren, I'll tell you this. This, as I have said many times, will do more for our families. Brethren, there are a whole lot of good things you can do in your family situations. But I tell you what, the primary thing is not that you have the ten best points figured out for how to be a good husband. Or that you figure out the proper age to potty train your child. Or ladies, what you ought to be putting on the dinner table. or any Those things are important in their place. But they are not the most important thing. And Paul knows it. Paul doesn't even deal with such things. He bypasses them all together. Why? Because in the end, brethren, if you've got husbands and wives and people, men and women, if, as we're living and functioning in the church, in the family, in our lives, in the workplace, in the schools, if, if, there, if we are a people who are entranced by the love of Christ, we feel it, we know it, we believe it, we experience it. Those manifestations of Christ are renewed and fresh and constant. If we live in that atmosphere, Paul knows. That's what it takes to be successful in this Christian life. That's what it takes to be successful as a Christian husband. That doesn't mean we don't need very specific instruction in certain areas. And that doesn't mean that the Scripture doesn't give it to us. But when we want to think about the very underlying principles, we can come back right here. Now brethren, I want to deal simply with not the breadth so much, or the height or the depth of Christ's love but I want to deal with the length of His love. And this is worth meditating on. But I, need, I feel like I need to kind of create some backdrop. With so many truths, they really tend to hit us when they're set over against certain other realities. Let me tell you something. You can't hardly... I'm shifting gears here. But you can't hardly open this book and read anywhere for too long before either some hint of the fact or at least some bold outright assertion of this. God has the capacity to hate. There are a lot of people that don't think that way. Brethren, Jesus, He's looking at the churches. To one of the churches there in Revelation 2 and verse 6, He says this, Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There's the Son of God, and He hates the works of the Nicolaitans. You say, well, what's that? I don't know. But He hates it. And of course, the Ephesians would have known what he was talking about. Hebrews 1.8, Of the Son, God the Father says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Now see this. Here's the Son of God. He looks at the churches and he says, If I find churches where that teaching of the Nicolaitans is, I hate it. The Father says of the Son, you hate wickedness. Brethren, wickedness isn't just what Hitler did. 
Wickedness is anything that's a deviation from what is perfect and upright and pure and righteous and good. Anything, everything. You come to the Scriptures and listen, don't mince words. Romans 9 says God hates Esau. Try to redefine it, try to re-explain it away, whatever. But that's what it says. That's a biblical reality. In Zechariah 8.17, God says that He hates when people devise evil in their hearts. Hosea 9.15, God says that He hates... This is amazing. In Hosea 9.15, God finally gets to the point where He looks at Israel. And He says, I hate not just what you do. I hate you. You say, does it say that? Yeah. It, brethren, I'm not having you turn to all these, but you can mark that down. You can come to back, back to that and study that later because I'm going to move on from there. But yes, it says that. It says because of the wickedness of their deeds, but it says He hates them, not just the wicked deed. In Jeremiah 12, 8, the Lord says that because Israel lifted up her voice against Him, He hates her. He says it again, Hosea 9, 15, Jeremiah 12, 8. God says, you go through the Scriptures, God says He hates robbery, He hates wrong, He hates pride, He hates arrogance, He hates the way of evil, He hates perverted speech, He hates haughty eyes, He hates a lying tongue, He hates hands that shed innocent blood, He hates a heart that devises wicked plans, He hates feet that make haste to run to evil, He hates the false witness, hates those who sow discord among brothers. The Lord hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Psalm 5, the Lord hates all evildoers. Just in the first book of the Bible alone, God comes along, He curses the first man and the woman. And then in the next chapter, He curses Cain. He sends fire down from heaven and wipes out in sulfur and brimstone entire cities, delivering only... Lot and his daughters turned his wife into a pillar of salt. God comes along and wipes out the entire earth save eight souls. Brethren, the Lord isn't messing around. And it goes on. And the thing is, here's here's the thing about it. Just as Hosea says, in Hosea 14.9, Now this is after he says that God hates Israel. Here's what he says. The ways of the Lord are right. When the Lord hates something or somebody, His doing so is right. In other words, like this, what God hates is hate-worthy. Right? He never hates anything that does not deserve to be hated. He hates all evildoers precisely for the fact that evil men ought to be hated by an infinitely pure and holy God. Listen, brethren, God only curses what is curse-worthy. He only abominates that which is abominable. Right? He's only offended by that which is offensive. The ways of the Lord are right. He only damns that which is damnable. Brethren, do you hear what... We, brethren, bring this home. Do you hear what I'm saying? God not only is said to hate the idolatry, He hates the idolator. Brethren, what were we? I'm speaking to you Christians. What were we when we were lost? I idolized all sorts of things. And yet went just cruising through life thinking, God's just happy with me. Boy, if I die, I'm certainly not so bad. He'd throw me into hell. And all the time, 
If I would have simply opened this Word and read in the right places, I would have found out it was not so. The Lord hates wickedness. Brethren, do you realize what Romans chapter 3 says? It doesn't just say those evildoers that God says He hates. That's us. That's us. Brethren, think with me. God hates rebellion. Were you a rebel? I was. What's rebellion? It means God says to do it and we say, I don't think I'm going to do that. God says, I abhor sexual sin. We say, oh, he'll understand. God says, he hates drunkenness. Oh, but certainly he doesn't want us not to have fun. He says, God hates robbery. God hates wrong. God hates pride. God hates arrogance. God hates evil. God hates perverted speech. He hates haughtiness, lying. More than that, God is said to hate the liar, the proud, the wicked, the one who loves violence. The Lord hates all evildoers. Brethren, I don't know how you would describe yourself in your lost state, but all that describes me. I was that object of God's hatred. Liar, proud, arrogant, perverted speech, haughty, rebellious. Brethren, that's me. That's how I lived. That was my day in, day out life. And I'm walking through life thinking everything is okay. When my eyes were the haughty eyes He hated. My tongue was the perverted tongue He hated. My feet were devising wicked. Brethren, I would wake up in the morning and figure out how I could just have pleasure breaking all of God's laws. That was me. Brethren, when Paul says in Ephesians 2.3, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were children of wrath. That's basically what he's saying. We were children of God's anger and fury. That's what he means. That's exactly what he means. Brethren, if... You remember how it was with Nadab and Abihu? They offered strange fire on the altar and what happened? (laughs) The flame came out and devoured them. Brethren, if we would have just been walking down the sidewalk and the flame would have come out and devoured us, it would have been right. If God would have dashed us into pieces, into burning hell forever and ever in unbearable torment and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, age after age after endless agonizing age, if the Lord would have done that, it would have been right. Everything about us was damnable and detestable and hate-worthy. Everything about us, brethren. Now, I know you didn't think so. And I didn't think so. You know why we didn't? Because the very pride that God so hates engulfed us. And in our pride, we thought we were good. We thought God was, frankly, pretty happy with us. But that very pride had us blinded to what we really were. Brethren, do you know, you remember how it was in the days of Josiah? You remember how it was? No, Josiah was a good guy, so I'm, I'm only bringing up this example because it just, it just struck me as, you remember how it was? There's Hilkiah the high. For all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us. Brethren, I'll tell you what, in our lost days, when we were thinking everything, brethren, I'm not alone in this, am I? Weren't, weren't you there as well? We thought it was okay. We actually thought that with all of our sin, somehow, this was all going to turn out for our good in the end. Brethren, I'll tell you what, if somebody would have brought us the book of the law and God would have gave His ears to hear, and they would have opened it to us, we would have, 
we would have been in that place to tear our clothes and repent in dust and ashes right there. Because brethren, you know what the Word says? The Word didn't say, oh, it's okay with you. The Word says God hates you. God finds you to be a very object of His wrath. And it says in John 3, we were under the condemnation of God already. Further on in John 3, it says those who do not obey the Son, it says the wrath of God remains upon them. The wrath of God was already on us. Isn't that what Romans 18 or Romans 1.18 says, the wrath of God is revealed. Not it's going to be. It already is. It was against us. And oh brethren, it's coming towards the sinner in a way that is like a rolling storm of wrath coming across that horizon. And it's going to dump on their heads in a way that it is not yet dumped. You see it there in Ephesians chapter 5. This is what the Lord says. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, what things? Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, idolatry, filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking, the wrath of God comes. It's presently coming upon the sons of disobedience. Brethren, do we look around and see people like this? You see, my friend, men are evil. They are disobedient. And they are filthy and they are condemned already under the fierce wrath of God already. And they're facing greater expressions of that wrath that is coming. Brethren, we live in a city of people right now preparing to watch football, preparing to eat and drink and pass their Sunday. And if you were to go to their door, they would tell you they think they will go to heaven. And the wrath of God is already bent against them. God's hatred burns in a way much like Josiah. He didn't realize it before that. But it was true. And when he read the words in this book, he found it to be true. And he didn't find it to be a laughing matter. He realized we are in serious trouble. Brethren, I'm describing what we were like. Do you realize in the Scriptures they find a man collecting sticks on the Sabbath? God says, kill him. As Hosea says, his ways are right. That man was wicked. That man was a rebel. Here's a man. Remember the young man who used the name he blasphemed it. They put him away until they could figure out what the Lord would have done with him. They went and inquired of it. The Lord said, kill him. And that was right. God said in a place I was just reading in my own devotions that God is going to come along to Jerusalem and wipe Jerusalem like one wipes a plate and turns it upside down. The Babylonians were coming and God was going to wipe them out. Brethren, do you realize God led Israel into the wilderness and most of them, we are told, perished? God allowed them to die out there. God killed many of them through all number of different ways. And it was right. Why? Brethren, God hates sin and He hates sin evildoers. And this is what the Scripture tells us. And that was us. Brethren, one of the reasons we don't understand the love of God aright is because we have way too high views of how God felt towards us. We just do not have a properly balanced biblical estimation of how God views lost people. It is utterly fearful. It is worth ripping your clothes and falling down in dust and ashes like Josiah. Brethren, do you realize that on Judgment Day, God is going to send... If not, look, look, if I read Matthew 7, 13 and 14 right, that few there be that find it, 
and yet there are many on the broad road. If I read that right, do you know what that tells me? In the last day, the vast majority of mankind are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Let me tell you what Jesus said about the lake of fire. Who was it created for? The devil and his angels. You basically, if you die in your sin, you will become such a perpetual and eternal object of God's hatred and wrath. He will deal with you like He will deal with the devil and his angels. Objects. Brethren, I'll tell you what, when God came along and killed Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Spirit of God, it was right. And when God puts the vast majority of sinners into hell, it will be right. The fullness of God's hatred will be poured out. And it will be right. And brethren, the truth is, I can tell you this, because, because of my own blindness... When I came to the Scriptures as a new convert and I read in Psalm 5, God hates all evildoers. And in Psalm 11, verse 5, that He hates those who are wicked. The violent. When I read those, I was shocked. But you know what? I shouldn't have been shocked. Because it's right. Brethren, you know what should have shocked me? And the more we come to know this, the more it ought to be shocking. Brethren, have you ever thought about this? An, an utterly shocking statement. Of course, G Jesus said this, and He said it over in Luke in a little bit different capacity. But listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7. If you then, who are evil... No, wait just a second. Brethren, there's no qualifier. God hates evildoers. He hates them. The Word says so. If you then, being evil... If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Listen, if Jesus had said, if you then who are evil can never come close to God, he will tear everything away from you and give you nothing except pain and misery because you're hateful and detestable to Him. What could we say? Wow, that's, that's right. We'd have to say just like Hosea. The ways of the Lord are right. That's right. The evil deserve to be punished. The evil deserved to have everything taken away. The evil deserve... We'd bow our heads. We'd have to bow our heads and say, wow, justice and righteousness of God, they're right. They're good. They're pure. But listen, what Jesus, is, Jesus is speaking to a multitude, but you'll know back there at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, His disciples came to Him. And He's, he's no doubt looking these guys right in the eyes. If you then who are evil... And he says this, your father. Now wait a second. Your father. How does that happen? And he's going to give good things to them, not fiery coals and sulfur and brimstone, but good things. I'm afraid we read over texts like that and we don't really realize what's happening. Do you realize Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Well, why? Why was the devil their father? Because they did things that were according 
They said, Abraham's our father. He says, no, Abraham is not your father. Why was Abraham not their father? Well, in lineage they were connected, but his whole point is, you don't do the things Abraham does. And the things you do, Abraham did not do. That makes him a father or not a father. And yet, isn't it amazing that then Jesus will say, you are evil, and then say, God is your father. It's like, what? A, that is such a shocking statement. I'm afraid we read across that, and because we live literally in an atmosphere saturated by men's high thoughts of themselves, we don't even grasp it. What he's basically saying is this. You who are evil and ought to be hated, God somehow becomes your Father. And rather than giving you what you deserve, you get good. Brethren, I'm telling you, when things like this are said, you remember the time when Elisha said, Lord, would you please open the eyes of my servants? And his eyes got open and he saw angels everywhere. I just read an account just recently of a man who's alive today and he's presently been serving over in Iran. And he was in a time that was very fearful. And he had his eyes open something like this. And he saw angels. Brethren, there are angels around us. I guarantee they were on that mountainside when Jesus was given His Sermon on the Mount. And when He said a statement like that, you know what Peter says, right? The angels long to look into this. You can imagine they were, they were like gathered up in a heap looking in there. What in the world? Think with me, brethren. The angels. What do they know of God? They know what Habakkuk said. He is of purer eyes than to look upon evil. They know they cannot stand even when you've got seraphim, these fiery creatures that have been created to stand in the very presence of God. They must cover their eyes. They know God is so holy and so pure, so magnificent. And here, Jesus is saying, you being evil, can stand in the presence of God as though He's your Father? What's this? We saw some of our own sin and God threw Him down immediately, sentenced Him to judgment, and it was over. Satan had no second chance. What in the world? This is why, I guarantee you, this is why Peter says the angels long to look into this. They do, what's going on here? Evil people are, are promised good. Evil people, He's going to make Him... How's this happening? Shocking, brethren. I'm sure the angels find it shocking. The reason that we don't is because, like I say, we live in this atmosphere where we all just think, well, of course God does all men good. God is love. He loves us all. He has a wonderful plan for our life. In the end, if, if somehow we, we wreck this thing, well, it's totally... It's, it's, it's totally now, it certainly isn't because God's wrath or God's hatred or God's fury or God's anger. It's, it's all because, well, He loved us so much and, you know, He's just done everything He can and He can't do anything more and now it's left up to us and if ultimately the failure comes here, well, if we end up in hell, it's all our fault. God never casts anybody there. But people don't say that because they've read their Bibles. They say that because that's what they want to think. They say that because they have a huge overestimation of themselves. They say that because men in their wicked and depraved state think that they're really pretty good people. They really do. This idea that men are utterly depraved just doesn't even come into their hearts. The fact that they're worthless, well, yeah, you know, I, I might not be perfect, but I'm certainly not so bad that I'd have to be sent to hell. I mean, that's basically the approach that man takes. Brethren, when John the Apostle comes along in 1 John chapter 3, and he says, we used to sing this at community, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Reads a little bit different in the ESV. When he says, brethren, we, we can read that, you know, Behold, what manner of love. That word behold is meant to be like an interjection. Behold! 
old. He's John, John. You ever heard John? Five times he says, I am the disciple whom the Lord loved. You ever catch that when you're reading John? Brethren, he wasn't doing that because he was proud. He was doing that because he knew it. I'm one of those people that's evil. And God has come to me. And God, brethren, do you see what's happening? He, five times he has to tell us, this is so amazing, I can't even believe it. The Son of God came to this earth and He loved me. He put His love on me. And he comes, he comes out and He says, I'm the one. Brethren, behold what manner of love. It's a manner of love that the angels can't even figure out. They're trying to figure this out. They said, well, you know, we're 185,000, one of them could say, I butchered in a day. Evildoers. That's what we're ready to do. We're ready to draw our swords and cut men down for all their wickedness. And here God's making Himself their Father. What is this? And John the Apostle, he's saying that, Behold, brethren, behold, what manner of love is it for a person who is evil and an object of God's hatred? For God to come in and somehow be able to take an object He hates and make that object His child. Now brethren, what I want you to see about this love, argue with me if you would like. Contest this if you want. But I have Scripture to back me, folks. God's love is particular. And what I mean about this, brethren, Jesus did not love everybody the way He loved John. That's just true. That's absolutely true. Brethren, someone might say, well, we're all God's children. God loves us all the same. Oh, no, 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 no. You ignore your Bibles to the core if you come to that conclusion. Look, God's loving gaze is particularly focused on some. It's much like, it's much like the, the illustration that came to my mind is the idea of a magnifying glass. You go out with a magnifying glass into the world. Yes, the sun shines everywhere, much like the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. But that magnifying glass takes the light and the heat and focuses it down to a point. Brethren, I'll tell you this. There are some people upon which that dot of God's love is focused. And the Bible throws this at us again and again. There are some of you in this room right now. And this is, the, this is what's so beautiful about the church. When the church, when Christians gather together, we have in one place a number of these people gathered together upon whom the intensity of that little dot of God's gaze, His love is focused. And we all come together and it's like that. Brethren, I tell you what, Jesus Christ knows that this church and every body of believers that is gathered together, brethren, just like He knew those churches in Asia Minor, He knows us. And when we come together, His attention is focused there. Brethren, listen to this. Isaiah, Isaiah 43, verse 3. Just, just let this sink in. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom. Now listen, Old Testament Israel is a type of the true people of God, the true Israel, which is Jew and Gentile gathered together into the church. And we're going to see it right here in this text. 
We're going to see it. But I want you to hear that because what's being said here is a picture of the redeemed. I give Egypt as your ransom. Well, physical Israel was ushered out of Egypt. A people who Moses said to them, look, God set His love upon you not because you were greater than any other nation. He set His love upon you, basically, Moses says, because He determined to set His love upon you. He killed all the firstborn of Egypt. He killed them. He didn't kill all the firstborn of the Israelites. He killed them. By the way, he had all the Canaanites put to death when they went into the land. Brethren, God's love is very specific. It's very peculiar. But listen to this. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Why? Because you are precious in my eyes and honored. And I love you. I will sacrifice others for you. His love is not the same. He specifically is loving Israel. I give men in return for you. Peoples. I give peoples in exchange for your life. I will sacrifice others that you might be spared. That's what he's saying. Fear not, for I am with you. Now listen to this. This is a picture of now this new covenant era. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Brethren, that's the Gentiles. Gather them in. Because my Israel, they're the true people, but it's not only going to be physical Israel. I'm going to gather them from the ends of the world. And God says, I love them with a specific love and I will give men in exchange for them. Give Egypt in exchange for them. Give Seba in exchange for them. I will give men in exchange for them because I love them. Peculiar, unusual, particular expressions of the love of God. The lo Brethren, listen to this. Listen to this. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good for His steadfast love endures forever. God's steadfast love endures forever. For everybody? Oh no. It endures forever. But not for everybody. You just hold your breath and you read a little further in Psalm 136. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. Well, that's kind of interesting, right? How does his steadfast love endure forever when he's striking down the firstborn of Egypt? Because the writer doesn't mean for you to understand that his steadfast love endures forever for Egypt. But for Israel, for whom the firstborn were struck down, Verse 15, to him who overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever and gave their land as a heritage, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for His steadfast love endures forever. Brethren, God's love is specific. It's focused. It's not on all people equally. Yes, the Bible teaches He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Yes, God's kindness is meant to lead men to repentance. And He shows that kindness. But brethren, God's love for a certain people is unique and comes way beyond that. Let's, let's just develop this even more. 
Solomon. 2 Samuel 12, 24. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her and she bore a son and he called his name Solomon. Listen to this. And the Lord loved him. The Bible never says that of Amnon. The Bible never says that of Absalom. Of Solomon it says, and the Lord loved him. That is language like you get with the Apostle John, right? Jesus loved me. He's a, I, if you would have been with John for about two seconds, and that's, you can tell by the way he writes. For him to tell us that five times in his gospel, you'd have been with him a little while and he'd have been saying, the Lord loved me. I think what he meant in all of that is even me. Solomon. Solomon says there in his song, your love is better than wine. The Lord chose to lay his love upon Solomon in a way that the other sons of David did not know. What? Melt, consider Daniel. Daniel 9.23 You are greatly loved. The angel said to him, Daniel 10.11 Oh Daniel, man greatly loved. And again in Daniel 10.19 Oh man greatly loved, fear not. When Daniel came out of the lion's den, certain men who had tried to frame Daniel were thrown into the lion's den. I, I want to say it says that they didn't even reach the bottom before the lions had just tore them to bits and crushed their bones. It was never said to them, O oh, greatly loved. Brethren, the love of God is discriminating. Let's go on. How about this? Paul, Galatians 2.20, he talks about the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Most of the Pharisees could not say that. To most of the Pharisees, what did they hear? Matthew 23.33, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? In John 8.21, Jesus said, to these Pharisees, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Brethren, do you think Paul was an object of God's hatred and wrath? He was walking around in this world killing Christians. He despised Christ and thought to do many things contrary to that name. And yet, Jesus comes and appears to him and makes him a vessel of his love. A hateful object. Daniel! You go to Daniel, he's confessing his sin and the sin of Israel to God. He did not exclude himself. He was not saying, I'm righteous. I don't deserve this. I'm loved because I'm better. Brethren, we sang the song, Why was I made to hear? When others make a wretched choice and rather starve than come. Brethren, Jesus, Jesus stands up to preach one day. And He says, listen, let me tell you something. In His preaching, He says, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel at such a time as the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up, there was no rain in the land, there was drought for three years and six months, a great famine, and Elijah was sent to none of the widows in Israel, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. You know what Jesus is admitting? He's admitting this. God shows kindness where He wills to show it. 
and doesn't show it where he wills not to show it. Now, doesn't that sound vaguely familiar to something else we read in the Scriptures? Such as, you remember, these words were originally spoken to Moses. Moses was allowed to come into the very presence of God and see His glory. Not the whole deal, but he got to see the afterglow of God. And that's when he said, I have compassion upon whom I have compassion. The rotted bodies of Pharaoh's hordes were at the bottom of the Red Sea. God says, I have mercy upon whom I have mercy. Moses, I have mercy on. Pharaoh and his group, I did not. And in fact, there in Romans 9, so then, God has mercy upon whom He will, and He hardens whom He will. Brethren, that is distinguishing love. Jacob have I loved. Why? Was he good? Jacob was... He had... had, I can point out to you things that Jacob did that God says he hates. And I can show you Jacob is the kind of person that God says he hates. So why did God choose Jacob and hate Esau? Brethren, this is what he says. I will have compassion upon whom I will have compassion. Brethren, we can't get around this. Christ sets His love on individuals on purpose. And the ones He sets His love upon they are hateful objects that He determines to love. They are worthy of hate. They are worthy of wrath. And He sets His love there. And not just lightly, He sets it there in full intensity. But then I end with this, brethren. The length of this love. This is where I've been headed. Here's the thing, brethren. Imagine with me. Go forward in time. Right off out into eternity. Let's imagine that that last verse of Matthew 25 has already taken place. Do you remember what happens? Jesus is there. All the nations are gathered before Him. Those on His right hand, He says, Well done. Enter this kingdom. I was sick and hungry. I was in jail. I was a stranger. You did this over here on the left. They did not. The ones show the marks of being saved, regenerated. The Spirit of God put love into their hearts and they in turn loved men. Over here, every indication of the unregenerate. Oh, they many in that day are going to say, Lord, Lord, They're going to claim to have been Christians, but they're a dead giveaway. They did not love. They were to themselves. What do you more than the tax collectors? They greet their own. Jesus said, love your enemies. These people did not. And here's what it says as you end up with Matthew 25. Those wicked ones go into everlasting, eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay, let's say we're past that. We're out there. Remember what, remember what Paul says to the Ephesians? So that in the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ. We're, imagine, brethren, we're out there. Ages upon ages. And God, immeasurable riches of grace and kindness just showering upon our heads. Oh, brethren, all the realities there in Revelation. The dwelling place of God is with men. He's with us. We behold Him face to face. We are His and He is ours. And He's wiped all the tears away and taken all the pain and there's no more death. And there we are out there, eternal life and pleasures forevermore. 
The Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. They're the lamps of the place. There's no darkness. Nothing that defiles is there. Brethren, we are just in the joy of beholding the face of Christ. But look, we look over there. Here are these that are said they're drinking the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of His anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels. The presence of the Lamb, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and ever. Brethren, I can imagine that. And you know who I see over there? I see guys I ran with in high school and college. A number of them I led into their crimes. Numbers of them I was worse than they were. I was more hateful to God. Family members that I got drunk with and I profane... Brethren, a man uses the name of the Lord God in vain once and he's brought forth and stoned. I use such filth with this mouth and this tongue. And there are people who spoke morally and they're out there in the fires. People that were better than me. Why? Why have I been made to hear Why? Why the difference? What sets us apart? Brethren, what I would say is when we're in that place, if somebody were to come along and say, well, God loves us all just the same. Brethren, that's just not true. When I'm there delighting in His smile and He immeasurable riches kindness just flowing over me and people who were better than me the smoke of their torment goes up forever and forever and forever they heard those dreaded words depart from me you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels and Christ himself is treading out the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Destruction of the ungodly. And I was more ungodly. Why the difference? There is a difference, brethren. There is a difference in the love. But when did that difference start? I mean, you can go back to Judgment Day. Did it start then? Did His peculiar love for those certain favored people, did it begin at Judgment Day? Did it begin on that day? Brethren, I think we can take it before then. Why? Because, brethren, I think we can take it at least back to the point when we were made alive together with Christ. Why do I say that? Well, because the Scripture says this, God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, made us alive together with Christ. Brethren, why were we made alive with Christ? Because of His love. The love must have been there then for Him to make me alive because that's what motivated Him. The love... His mercy was motivated by love to make me alive with Christ. So I can take that distinguishing love of God back to then. You say, well, how is it distinguishing? Because this, it doesn't say God offered to make anybody alive who would come forward and seek to be made alive. Christ Himself said, None can come unto me unless my Father draws him. Brethren, we were dead. Dead people love sin. We were made alive in Christ 
because of a pre-existing love. And that love is what made us alive. But we can take it before then, because if you know Ephesians 2, you know that I left a little phrase out of that verse. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, when we were dead, when we were dead, brethren, in our trespasses, the distinguishing love goes even back before we were converted. When we were still dead in our trespasses and sins. Brethren, God deals with us in this world with distinguishing love. Have you ever heard this? I love this one. Revelation 3.9 Behold, Jesus says, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews. These are people who believe they were people of God. In many ways, moral. In many ways, not like the pagan Gentiles. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I loved you. That is, that is fantastic. Brethren, do you realize what that's saying? People are going to come. He's speaking to a church of His redeemed. And He says to His own people, I am going to make such distinguishing love between you and others. I'm going to have them come and bow down at your feet. Not bow down to me! And I'm going to tell them, but bow down at your feet. And it is going to be proven to them that I loved you. Obviously, in a way that He did not love those that are bowing down to the feet. Or else the whole thing means nothing, right? Brethren, we can trace this love back to when we were dead in our trespasses, according to Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But brethren, we can take it back before then. We can take it back at least as far as the cross. Why? What happened at the cross? Jesus, or, or Paul said, the Son of God loved me and gave Himself for me. Somebody will say, well, yeah, but He means for everybody. Well, that's not what He's saying. He says, Jesus loved me. And at that cross, He gave Himself for me. And I'll tell you this, one of the things that will floor you about the depths of Christ's love is that it is distinguishing and you're an object of it. Jesus wants us to know, I love you in a way that I don't love everybody else. Why would He say that to, to that church? Why, why say to them, I'm going to have certain people come and bow down before you and know that I loved you, if it's not because He wants to communicate to them that He does love them in a way that He doesn't love the people that are bowing down at the feet. Brethren, he wants us to glory in the fact that on that cross, He died specifically for a people. But we can go back before the cross. How? Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. In love. In love. This constraining love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Brethren, He does not predestine everybody to be sons. Because not all become sons. Because hell is going to be filled by the vast majority of mankind. In love. That, well, when did that happen? When did in love he predestined? When does predestination happen? Well, you go back a verse before, right there at the beginning of verse 4, and it says this, even as he chose us. When? Before the foundation of the world. In love, He predestinates us to be what? Adopted! That means when He says, you who are evil, your Father. When was it determined that those evil people would be adopted into a family where they could call God their Father? 
before the foundation of the world. Brethren, Psalm 103.17, the steadfast love of the Lord. And we already saw it. It's not for everybody. It's for peculiar people. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting. The steadfast love. And if you say, well, that steadfast love is just as general love, you know it doesn't go to everlasting. Because there's an end, brethren, when everybody who rejects Christ comes to an end of the mercies and the kindness of God. When His love and every expression of kindness is taken away forever. This steadfast love is the love that God has for His elect. This is why, and I I just wrap up, brethren. Paul comes along to the Romans and he says, look, whom God predestinates. When does predestination happen? At least before the foundations of the world. And what are you going to say there? Okay, well before the foundations of the world, He chose us. And what are you going to do? Come to some point in time and say, well, there's the point. Okay, what? Like God didn't know that thought before that moment? And so you go back and you keep going back. And that's why the psalmist says, it's from everlasting to... Brethren, as ancient as the very omnipotent throne of God itself, so long has been God's love for His chosen ones. Brethren, this is why we say, why was I made to hear when the multitudes, they would rather refuse to eat and die. Why? That Paul comes along and he says, whom he predestinated, he also did what? He called them. No exceptions. And those he called, what does he do? He justifies, which must mean He gives them that gift of faith that you see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And those He justifies, He does what to? He sanctifies them. And those that are sanctified, glorified. And brethren, it's an unbroken chain. None fall out. His love literally sweeps from everlasting... Brethren, I'll tell you this. You just sit and start contemplating for a moment that the Lord Jesus Christ has thought on us through all the ages. He's had thoughts of good and love. Brethren, for the Lord of lords to have thoughts of good towards you, an object of God's hatred, for even a minute would make us just shout hallelujah. It's more than we could fathom. But when we come to just think in all of our depravity and all of our wickedness and all of the things we've done, I've personally done and you have done, to come to that realization, Christ has had thoughts of good towards me without end. Forever and forever and forever and forever. Try to start and span the vastness and sum Jesus has had us in His thoughts. Brethren, the old Gordon Bayless used to say this, this thing will blow your mind if you really start thinking about this. You just let these thoughts pour in about His love, the intensity of His love going to the cross for a people that are written on His heart from everlasting. This love is ancient. Brethren, the Scriptures speak about a book of life written before the foundations of the world. And it's true. Christ's love for us does not suddenly come into being. We're known to Him in ages past. His affections rested on us from all eternity. And brethren, I'm just... Some some person's going to say... I just say this to you fearing ones. 
Jesus said this in one very profound sermon. All that the Father gives to Me, all those whom we in the Godhead have set our love on forever and forever, all that the Father has chosen and that He's given to Me, they will come to Me. It's not even left up for debate, folks. You say, what what if I'm not one of them? What if I'm not one of the chosen? Jesus, very quickly after He says that, says this, Him that comes to Me, I will not cast out. In other words, brethren, the very surest proof that you are one of these very special, particular objects of the focused love of Christ is that you have a desire in here to come to Him. Listen, if you don't want to come to Him, don't find fault with Him for not being chosen. If you don't want to obey Christ, if you don't want to follow Christ, if you don't want to submit to Him, if you don't want to put your trust in everything He did on the cross for sinners, don't find fault with Him. Because He says if you'll come, come. And if you come, He's not going to cast you out. And if you come, then you're going to find that you are one of these objects of His love and it will just roll and bowl you over. Brethren, it's true. No one, as Christ said in John 4.65, no one can come to the Father or can come to Christ unless it's granted Him of the Father. Only those can go for whom it's granted to be special objects of His love. And if you're here today and you say, man, that's just what I've always wanted, then Jesus says, come. If you would come, then come and I'll accept you with open arms, and I will shower this love you've been hearing about on you.